Um, good evening here in Nairobi, where I'm hosting um, our 2020 watch list um, policy um, dialogue. Um, welcome to our first day, um, session two, um, where we're looking at seven years on, how, to, how can the EU help stabilize the Sahel? Um, on our annual um, watch list um, policy dialogue, um, this is a series of roundtables discussing international crises, the drivers of hostility, and the causes of instability and looking at um, policy options, especially for the EU and its member states to prevent, mitigate and help resolve deadly, um, deadly um, conflicts as well. The event is part of a project um, being co-funded by the European Commission under the instrument contributing to stability and peace um, in, in partnership with the European um, external action services. Um, this year, the event, which is spread over two days, this is day one, is on the record and is open to policy practitioners, regional experts, um, diplomats working on peace and security from the European Union and its member states, civil society, and international organizations. And each of our sessions draws from the analysis and recommendations presented by crisis groups yearly, um, sort of yearly issues um, in the EU watch list, the watch list uh, 2020 and its May and September 2020 updates. And it builds on, uh, you know, engagement and assessment um, of our EU um, team based in Brussels as well. Um, crisis groups, analysts and experts, panelists will discuss um, how the EU can play a stronger role um, in conflict prevention and peace building and address the key policy challenges to generate stronger um, prospects for, for peace. Um, the meeting is on the record, um, is live, being live streamed um, on Crisis Group's um, YouTube channel. So for today's session, um, it's, on the, it's on the Sahel. Um, it gives me really great pleasure to introduce um, um, Ambassador Johanna Am Am Adamson. She is the Deputy Special Representative for, of the Secretary General um, for MINUSMA, the UN mission um, in, in Mali. And it's really a pleasure to welcome you um, today, Ambassador Adamson. And joining her also is Ambassador Akhrel Losada, <laughs> um, the European Union Special Representative for, for the Sahel. I have a secret for you, Ambassador. Um, Jean Hervé, who is also has Spanish origins, he sent me a recording of how I should pronounce your name appropriately. And as I am Anglophone, we, we, we struggle with the pronunciation. So I, I hope I didn't abuse your name um, too much. And of course, um, I don't think I need to introduce him. My colleague, Sean Hervé Jezekel, um, project director for the Sahel, um, in, in, in just recently back from Bamako, I believe, or maybe he's still there or he's in the is in back in, uh, in Dakar. So I keep an eye on my colleagues, you can tell. And then Ibrahim, Yaya Ibrahim, our Sahel um, analyst for the International Crisis Group also, and I know he's in, in Bamako at the moment. So our session um, today, we're looking at the EU's um, seven years of engagement. Um, and it's, it's seven years in which the EU has been extensively um, engaged in sort of every aspect of trying to deal with peace and security I mean, the Sahel was first starting in, in, in Mali and then Niger and, and Burkina Faso. And in a sense, you know, for those of you who've watched very closely and intently and have focused on the EU's own activities, this in a sense is very much a test case um, for the EU's um, foreign policy um, in, in the region, both for Brussels as an institution, but also for member states. And, you know, when you look at the, the plethora of activities that the EU finds itself in from security to development to humanitarian relief. And so it's been a very intense engagement. And yet we do have to ask ourselves that question and it's an awkward question, despite this intense engagement, um, you know, despite this heavy lifting um, by the European Union, but also other actors, which is why we have our um, ambassador from the UN on, on the panel with us, despite this, we witnessed, uh, and we're still witnessing a rise in communal um, violence, worrying developments, particularly in central Mali, where um, um, Ibrahim has been heavily engaged. And as we all know, um, we've witnessed the, the coup um, in Mali last August. And on top of that, now the region is having to deal with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So all of these factors, you know, put a strain on the region's own st stability going forward but critically also for, for governance and for helping to sort of rebuild the state and, and central authority as well. So in this session, um, 
in a sense, it, it is a review of the EU's own work, um, you know, sort of what it's done in the past, what it's doing today. And, and it's also, and, you know, very much want our panelists, but also our participants um, to look forward and to be forward thinking in terms of where next for the European Union in terms of its role and its work with both within um, the European Union, but also um, with, its, with its partners as well. So this is our panel. I'm very glad to introduce them. And I do want to welcome our participants. Um, please do prepare your questions um, very early on because we will have a Q&A session. And we're using an interesting system where participants will be able to sort of upvote their questions. And you, know, you get to decide which questions um, you want our panelists um, to, to answer as well. So as moderator, I will be looking at, at what you've recommended to our panelists to, to, to sort of put forward as a question. Our Zoom coordinator will press, the, will press the answer for the questions that have already been answered, so we don't need to worry about that as well. So I'm going to um, begin, um, and I'm going to obviously throw the question as I think I should appropriately, because in a sense, we've put in the EU um, you know, on the spotlight. And I guess the first question then to you, um, um, Ambassador Losada, you've just come back from from Mali, so you'll definitely have some perspectives. And I guess two, two questions in one. One is a sense for you to look backwards and to see how effective, um, if, you're able to, if you're able to assess your own self, how effective the EU has been. But looking forward, um, because we, know, we also know that the EU is preparing its own strategy for the Sahel, what are the key ingredients and are those ingredients in, them, in themselves based on lessons learned, um, based on what you've learned? Will, those, will the lessons learned inform the way forward for your strategy? Ambassador Lasado, over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much for the International Crisis Group for this opportunity to talk about the, the Sahel, which is now at the heart of our, of our, of our interest. Because I always say something that the, the security of the Sahel is closely, closely linked to the security of Europe and in general, the international security. And that's uh, an element very sure. Very briefly, because I'm, I want to be interactive, but uh, I would like to go in the past and what is coming in the future. In the past, you know that uh, the EU had its first, the first strategy on the Sahel, we're more than 17 today, was the EU strategy. It was very simple, just to link security and development, no security without development, no development without security. This, of course, today is widely accepted, but uh, at that time also, in 2011, before the events in Mali, that, was, that wasn't that, that sure. And I think, uh, it was, I wouldn't say it was revolutionary because it was in the pipeline of uh, most of the uh, think, think tanks and uh, most of the action, but that was really um, a very important moment that uh, the EU re really linked security and development, not separated the, these, these, two, these two worlds. Then uh, this, uh, this strategy was developed in a sort of regional action plan with um, priorities, fight against, um, fight, fight, and the fight against radicalization, uh, problem of youth, migration, also the question of border controls and all the security aspects. And now we see that the EU, and you probably said when you talk, that the EU has, is really very strongly engaged with around 8 billion euros for this period from 2015 to 2020 uh, with the EU and its member state, and with more today than 7,000 Europeans on the ground. And after the events in Mali, one can really ask, have we done the right thing? And what mistake have we done? Well, I'm, I am optimistic by nature. I always say that uh, if we haven't done anything, the thing would be worse than, than it is. We all know how the situation is going. We all know that there is an insecu the insecurity is growing, unfortunately, that there is a problem of maybe a spillover of insecurity all over other, all over other countries in the Gulf of Guinea, for instance. But nevertheless, this action of the EU has put on the thread, and that the fact is that most of the countries or most of the international organization have now their strategy for the, for, the, for, the, for the sale. Then now, as you really said, we have a new, a new trade. And what is this kind of new strategy that we want to, to establish? First, we have to have a new strategy, as the high representative said, because we have a new architecture in the region. At that time in 2011, we didn't have the G5. We, did, we, we didn't have all the cell coalition that we talk later pro probably with these four pillars. Uh, we didn't have all the presence of MINUSMA, of course. 
We didn't have all the main actors that were on the ground today, then we need to adapt it. And also we need to take into consideration not only this link between security and development, but also the humanitarian one. The situation in Burkina, as you know, today is, is dramatic. There is more than one million refugees in, in, in Burkina. The question of human rights is an essential question for the, for the EU. Then we have been rethinking and we want a new strategy, more objective oriented, first element, and second element, we want a strategy that is more political. What do I mean by more political? We want to discuss more with our partners, with our African partners, about the different elements that we think must be reached or the different objectives that must be reached. We need a more, a stronger political, a stronger political dialogue in our, in, our, in, our, in our approach with them, but with an element also that we keep very, very closely and very strongly, which is the criteria of ownership. Uh, ownership must be also at the center of uh, all our, our action in the, in the Sahel. And that's what actually is inspiring all this structure that is being created with the coalition, with the coalition, uh, with the coalition Sahel. I don't want to be too long. I prefer to ask some questions, but I put it yeah. more or less in this, in this aspect. We had our strategy. This strategy, and we'll come to that later, uh, has failed. I wouldn't say has failed. The events in Mali show us that something wrong has happened. We haven't foreseen what was happening with no doubt, but nevertheless, this strategy has put us in the, in the path in order to have a new and more adapted strategy now that we are discussing, not only within the EU and with our African partners, but also with, uh, with our other partners, with the UN, also with, uh, with the African Union, with the G5, also with the main actors, uh, the US, Canada, more of them. I always preside or co-chair uh, chair, co-chair, uh, what I call the envoys group, and we had a very extensive discussion actually on this new strategy. I will stop here, uh, not to go too far. I, I told I had three minutes. I think I, I've been even over that, but that's more or less how I wanted to, to place uh, the question. And I can tell you that the EU is fully engaged with the high representative uh, himself, is fully engaged with our um, participation in the, in the Sahel, revising maybe uh, our action or adapting them to the new circumstances. Thank you. Good. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. And John Ove, one of the things that, you know, that, that we've always sort of discussed at crisis groups um, has been the absence of politics or the lack of a sort of a political strategy. And here you have Ambassador Lozado telling us that, um, that at the heart of this new strategy will be an emphasis on a political, uh, uh, will be an emphasis on politics um, on, and on dialogue. Um, it would be good to sort of get your own response to that because, you know, one of the other concerns that we've had is about how you know, the regional partners, um, the Sahel Alliance, the G5, the P3, P3S, the French initi initiative, how they all work alongside together and how we can sort of build consensus on what is what a political strategy should look like. And I'd like to get your thoughts of sort of going forward, what you think that political strategy should look like that underpins the EU and other partners' um, engagement in the Sahel. Uh, given also that Ambassador Lassad, and I was, I'm really glad that you said that yourself, Ambassador, that you said, well, with Mali, there's a sense in which we've failed because that coup happened. So knowing that, jean Hervé, what is sort of your own perspective? Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with uh, Ambassador Lassad. I think we are entering into a very interesting moment right now, a very important moment for stabilization strategies for the EU and for other partners. I think that they were quite, you know, I mean, there was some disappointment with the way the situation in the Sahel has developed in the last few years. And of course, given the, the resources invested, the energy invested in the region, there are disappointments with the stabilization strategies trying to deal with the crisis. Of course, this is not to say that, you know, the EU was responsible for, for this failure, that the French or that the UN are responsible. But to be sure, you know, the different strategies has not succeed, succeeded in, in stabilizing, you know, the situation. But I think that in the last few months, you know, there is a growing appetite. Uh, first, to understand why there was uh, such limitations and an appetite also to adjust the strategy. And I think that's, that's welcome and that's, that's an opportunity to be seized. Uh, at ICG, we, we think that there, there is a need for a strategic rewriting of the stabilization strategy. It's, it doesn't mean a complete rewriting of the strategy, but more a reordering of the priorities. 
basically most of the prior, most of the strategies, including the EU, they have three main pillars. You have the political pillar, the, the development one, and the security one. And, and I think that you know, so far, you know, these three pillars were, were there, there were no clear order, you know, clear ordering between the pillars. And 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 de facto on the ground, I think that security prevails because it's a war. But I think that there is a need to actually reorder these pillars and to, probably to, to put the political pillar, the governance pillar first. It should come first because this is the main crisis. This is the, the, root, the, the, the root causes of the crisis in the Sahel. Um, and then security and development should come you know, in support of this uh, central pillar. Of course, you know, I mean, it's going to be challenging. First, you know, like, like Ambassador Olsana said, you know, there is a question, an issue with ownership. You know, if you talk about governance, it's only the second state who can be in the driving seat and not any other external partners. Uh, the issue is how to work and, and, and where to start when we're talking about politics and when we're talking about changing governance. Here again, I think that ICG is trying to help by highlighting you know, a few areas in, on which uh, the strategy can focus. And I think that we come up with, with three kinds of propositions. First is, you know, Fiscal discipline, you know, another name for fighting corruption. I think it's it's in the interest of of, Syrian, uh, of the Syrian state partners, but it's also a request coming from the society in the Sahel. Second, it's also the 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 capacity to deliver social services. A lot has been done, a lot of efforts, but not enough on the ground, and especially in the rural countryside. What should be done is really an effort to deal with a, with a crisis that, that is really important in the rural areas. And here, you know, you need to, to restore, you know, I will switch to French because it sounds better in French, you know. Il faut restaurer l'utilité de l'État plus et avant que l'autorité de l'État. You know, the, the usefulness of the state, you know, before than the, the authority of the, of the state. And then the last point maybe is, uh, it's in the capacity of the state, restoring the capacity of the state to peacefully mediate in local conflict around, you know, local re uh, around natural resources. This is a key aspect. The jihadists are winning this war, you know, because they are able to offer mediation capacity, not necessarily peaceful mediation capacity, but mediation capacity in local conflict. The state has to step in, you know, and, and, and to recover its capacity to mediate in these local conflict around resources. John Ave, thank you. Um, Ambassador um, Lesodo, um, John Ave raised a number of questions and I, I feel as though you, you should have the right to reply, especially in the way he, he suggested that we needed to sort of reorder the priorities and, and readapt the, those, those priorities. And I want to sort of get your own take on, 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 on his suggestion and whether you see it that way or you see it in a, in a different way. No, no, absolutely. I fully agree with that. Actually, uh, we had a brainstorming uh, among ourselves with the high representative and uh, we came, well, we came to a conclusion. You don't need to come to a conclusion. So I think so obvious that uh, that one of the main aspects, the main problem that we have to face is the problem of governance. Uh, this is, this with no doubt, is the center of the crisis. Uh, governance, which has a lot of implication of consequences. If there is a lack of governance, as it has been said, by uh, Jean Hervé, uh, there is immediately a lack of confidence between uh, the, the, the population and the governors. There is a lack of legitimacy, of, de of democratic legitimacy. There is a lack of uh, territorial governance also. There are some areas, uh, as I said, you know, I was coming from Kidal, it's, uh, I mean, uh, the presence of the state is not there. I mean, uh, it is, they try to, they're, they're doing all their, all their best. We work with the governor. Um, but uh, the governor uh, was uh, was uh, in a not in an easy situation. We had we went to see also something very interesting. Uh, the 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 camp the camp number one with the reconstituted army, uh, which is uh, really the embryon of the future of the peace process. I will come to the peace process later because this I have something uh, yes yeah. to say. Mm -hmm. But I fully agree uh, with Jean on the problem of governance. There is a mm -hmm. big lack of governance, and that's why I said that we need a more political dialogue with them. Yeah. But also uh, we must be con conscious that the population uh, need to have this confidence. Then we have also to have a sort of impact with the population, always being careful of the problem of ownership and not to in, in, interfere in, in, in the internal question. I mean, it is a very difficult balance, but what we want is the best for them 
uh, and the best for us because we are fully, fully involved in the evolution of the, of, the, of the cell. But yes, governance is at the heart of the problem and that's what has been happening since 2012, uh, a lack of our governance. And we need a more, I wouldn't say democratic, of course, more democratic, we need a more uh, structured confidence between the population that believes that their leaders are really the leaders that are, have the authority to, to lead them for development and for security, and not only uh, to to be richer, and the problem of corruption comes comes there. This is this is the main question, but that's an internal question also uh, that must be resolved because mm -hmm. must be resolved by themselves, and will support in this in this process. Good. That 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 gives me a perfect sort of segue to ask um, Ambassador um, Joanna Ad Adamson because that 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 is the really the the, the key challenge. That how how do how do international actors like yourself, like the, like the European Union, um, how do you operate in a country like Mali that is so diverse and so large with so many different sort of um, segments that need to be addressed? You know, Ambassador Lozado and John Ave have said that, you know, that, that at the heart of the matter is a, is a wider governance um, crisis, you know. So for the UN coming in, in partnership with, with the EU, how do you see your, the, the role of the UN working with the, with the EU in able to address the vast array of challenges that confront uh, Mali that allows you to work in concert with the EU on, on addressing these, these, these key issues, whether it's governance, you know, whether it's, you know, as John Aves talks about fiscal discipline, but we can't ignore the security. I mean, if you don't have an, an enabling security and environment, then governance becomes a secondary issue and all the other development issues become a secondary issue. So I'd be interested to get your take in how do you then manage in this kind of, kind of environment? Uh, thanks very much. And um, I also wanted to thank uh, ICG for uh, the good reports that we get, which feed into uh, reflections. Um, what I would say is I think uh, the first thing is, is to have a sense of, of humility and to recognize the need to pause and adapt maybe every now and then. And I think this year with the coup d'etat in Mali has been one of those moments where we are reflecting with other partners, but more importantly with Malians as to what's gone wrong. Um, I think there's a danger when you work in Mali that you say it's just so complex and then you get sort of paralyzed by analysis. At this current moment in Mali, I think we have actually a good opportunity because the transition government has uh, come up with what it's called the, the roadmap along with the chart of the transition. So within those 18 months of the transition, and that's comprised, they've set out six axes as they call them, six areas. And interestingly, only one of those areas is about security. Um, a couple of the other really critical areas are about political reforms and good governance. So I'd say the, one of the first things is about uh, listening to Malian voices at this time. People have uh, you know, come out and said, really diagnosed some of the problems in, in the debates that have been around the coup and said, it is a loss of confidence in the governance system with the political elite. And, and the Malians themselves have started to therefore diagnose the problems and what might be the solutions. So I think one, one thing I would say is to try and find um, something which is a little less complicated and rally around something like the transition process. We in the UN have a mandate and we continue to look at the implementation of the Algiers Peace Accord as one critical element. We also look at how to help stabilize the center as another element. But after the 18th of August, we've been asked to try and support the transition. So I think the trick in this is, is to really, as we're gathering ourselves and thinking about what needs to be done, we try and see how we can bolster Malian pilotage, Malian leadership of these different um, areas of work. The other thing I would say is we bandy around words like governance and democracy and elections. I think it's important not to confuse elections with democracy or governance. We know that the ultimate destination after 18 months is a set of elections, which is to you know, restore all sorts of constitutional um, activities. But the taking the time to work on things like the refoundation of the state, not to have completed all the work on that. I think that's another key issue is within the 18 months, we with the Malians are only going to be able to achieve so much. And what we will, but what we will also do is homework, which the next set of 
um, elected officials can work on. So when I look at the refoundation of the state, that's one area where we need to carry on with the work. But meanwhile, there are some critical issues such as security, decentralization and pushing resources out to different regions, getting on with implementation of the um, peace accord that need, need to be done throughout the 18 months. But I would say that we need to triage, led by the Malians, as to what the work plan is going to be. And just yesterday, um, or rather today, they had a cabinet meeting where they're going to talk about what their work plan is. And we then need to come in behind that. And we need to define very clearly what is the role of each international actor. There's still a lot of competition around helping, even something like inclusion of women in peace processes. I could name you five different entities that want to get involved in that. But we have to somehow have the humility as international actors to say, Malian lead, we will come in behind. So we need to try and simplify, I think, as well, what we um, are trying to do. And, and let this process of introspection go forward. Let some of these difficult debates get onto the table. Stay focused on the 18 months timetable, um, but really follow what's emerging from the Malian transition planning um, and, and not be tempted to try and impose our agenda on, on their menu. Back to you. Ambassador, that's fantastic, and I'm, 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 I'm going to want to come back to that later, especially in, in the, in the Q&A, and, and probe um, with you further what we're understanding about that transition plan. But, but, but Ibrahim, I mean, you spent a great deal of your time in Central, in Central Mali, and, and in the end, the heart of the matter is, is the violence. And, and as I said in the, at the beginning, we've seen a continuation of, of violence um, spreading, particularly in central, in central Mali. Um, and it's a sort of a dramatic manifestation of the limit, limitations of both the national, regional and international um, re response. And I'd like to get your take, you know, having heard what um, Ambassador Abdesim has said about, you know, what the transition plan um, is, is offering, what at the end of the day, what does it mean in a central Mali context where it seems as though there are limits to what the international and regional and national response can offer to turn the tide um, in, in the central Mali, Mali context. I'd, I'd like to consider how we think about that within, the, within, that, within that context. Thank you very much, um, uh, Comfort, for this question. Um, one of the things uh, that is usually oh, um, seen clearly is that there is sometimes some disconnects between um, what is happening in Bamako and what is happening um, uh, at the periphery, in particular uh, central Mali, uh, for example. Um, uh, uh, violence is one of the things that have contributed to the uprising um, that um, uh, led to the to the to to, to the previous government to step down, uh, and so far we see that um, this violence still continues and uh, um, uh, still uh, um, uh, uh, threatening to to destabilize um, the transition itself. Now, um, if, when we talk about violence in Central Mali, uh, we have to distinguish between two places. Um, uh, one that is uh, uh, in the Masina area, where we have jihadist groups that are um, in control of the territory, and uh, the fact that they, they their control is not uh, very much challenged, we don't see much of um, uh, 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 violence there. The place where we see violence uh, actually right now is uh, a relatively small area um, that represents 4.3% of the Malian territory. Um, but uh, this small area has concentrated um, uh, a significant portion of the, the violence. In 2019, it concentrated over 60% of the entire violence that occurred um, uh, in, in Mali in, in the whole country. Uh, this means that um, I, 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 there is a hope here that if you concentrate effort um, in this particular area um, by the Malian government and uh, backed by the international community, we can get to make um, uh, so, some good uh, improvement in the region. Um, recently, Crisis Group came up with a report about um, how uh, we can actually uh, try to reverse the, 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 um, the, the deadly trend and to pave the way toward um, peace in that region. And I would uh, quickly summarize um, the, the, the policies that we recommend in, in that particular area. First, we think that 
um, we, we needed to try to de-escalate de the conflict by combining two things, um, uh, dialogue initiatives with security um, initiatives. Now, there are many dialogue initiatives that are engaged by various actors um, that are not very effective so, effective so far. Um, and that this is because they are mainly intermittent, they, are, they overlap, and they compete sometimes um, with one another. What is needed um, now is to streamline these efforts um, to make them more consistent um, and uh, uh, to make them cover the entire country, um, uh, the, the, the entire uh, area of uh, the Zen of Zonde. Um, we can do that by systematically establishing local peace committees um, in all the conflict hotspots and uh, uh, complement those local peace committees with um, a regional committee. Um, dialogue it, it, uh, alone is not sufficient. Uh, we have to um, also make efforts, increase um, efforts uh, to uh, uh, secure uh, local populations to, to protect civilians and their properties. And here, uh, and um, I'm happy that uh, our Ambassador Adamson is here. We, we think that MINUSMA, um, in collaboration with the Malian Army, um, can make a, a big difference here. I'm happy to answer more questions um, about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 those two combined might help um, to create, to de-escalate the conflict and uh, lay the ground for a more structured response um, to the conflict, which would uh, uh, implicate the return of um, the states. And I would like to make sure that there is no, um, uh, uh, there is no uh, stabilization of the area without the, 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 the states coming back, but it is, has to be a different state. It has to be a state that um, is, more, is showing more usefulness to the local population um, than what we have seen um, uh, so far. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and we have also to focus on disarming um, uh, the, 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 those who, 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 who um, took uh, weapons. Um, uh, and uh, these two things um, should uh, help to, um, to stabilize the region. After that, we have to think about the long-term solution to the problem, which would um, uh, uh, include um, reforming access to natural resources, because this is really a crisis um, related to the access to natural resources and particular land issues. Um, and uh, here we have to, uh, to, to, to think of uh, the, the mechanisms um, that help to regulate a dispute over natural resources because the current ones, um, whether they are traditional mechanisms or state-led mechanisms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they are all um, um, uh, 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 incapable of, of, of making the difference and they have to be changed. Great. Um, Ibrahim, that, that's really great. And Ambassador um, Adamson, I actually want to come back to you because I've just noticed um, some of the questions in, in the Q&A and they're ones that I was going to ask and I'd, I'll, I'll park my questions to the side. But um, sort of turning back to you as a way into the Q&A um, and the questions that have been asked in sort of in response to what uh, Ibrahim said, but also because you said that we should, we should simplify um, the international should simplify their task and follow the transition map. That the Malian um, transition gov transitional government has already sort of underlined um, and emphasized the need for an inclusive dialogue as a key pillar of their own strategy. So in response to, to, to Ibrahim's question and maybe sort of for the purposes of our, our friends at the EU, you know, how open should international actors be in backing sort of um, a dialogue between government and armed groups, including some jihadi groups um, in the region, um, given the, the local impetus that, that, that Ibrahim, that Ibrahim um, asks. I mean, it's, it's a sensitive, it's a delicate question, but I, I put it to, to you instead of Ambassador Lozada at the, at, the, at the moment, yeah. Sure, I'm um, very happy to, to engage on that. And I think coming back to the, uh, the central region, I very much agree with Ibrahim, what he's described as you know, the top needs are like reconciliation. I, I put security in there, just in the sense that for people to, to come to you know, meetings and talk to each other and be able to work out their problems, they do need to have some kind of, of security, uh, whatever that, that looks like. Um, I think that therefore when you talk about reconciliation and what I call conflict management strategies, uh, sustainable conflict management strategies. You know, there's, there's a, a risk that one can dictate too much to the Malians themselves about who they should talk to and how they should do it. I mean, uh, 
my Secretary General Antonio Guterres has actually, you know, been been quite clear that you know if, if the if the Malians wish to engage in dialogue, you know, that's that's up to them. So I'm not here to say, you know, that they can't do that. And I think some of the people who are engaged in the centre um, from different sides um, probably also fall already into two camps. You know, you might think sort of one day during the day, someone looks like um, they're a Fulani activist and then by night they might be sympathetic to, to one of the more extremist groups. So I think that we, should, we have to recognize that there's a very mixed bag of people involved in the center. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? That in the past you'd have Dozo, Bambara, Pearl able to sort out their, um, proximate sort of problems together in one way or another. But since 2015, you've had um, extremist elements coming in deliberately stoking up um, disagreement be between the different ethnicities. And the key challenge, I think, is how to sort of pull back that genie um, and, and get back to uh, a way where the uh, local communities, with the support of the state, the state being a kind of enabler and a referee at the same time, can support the communities to, to find ways to, first of all, identify the problems. Some of them are gonna be longer term problems. They're things like land reform, the impact of climate change, what that means up for natural resources. But some of them will be more immediate. You know, you just attacked my village, therefore what am I gonna to do to your village? And, and, and I think we, we, Ibrahim is also right that there's, a, there's just a confusion of different mediation actions and again one of the things to do with the local communities but with the Malian um, transition authorities think like can we please have a stock take of who's doing what and again it's about defining who is going to play what role um, but in terms of you know who should talk to whom I don't think that's something that um, we in the UN would ever want to dictate to uh, the host nation that we're in and all the different actors you know we focus on silencing the guns and um, but we also focus on tackling impunity. So if people have been responsible for massacres in certain areas in the center or action against our peacekeepers, then it isn't as though we just forget the past. I think there has to be some accountability for what's happened in the central Mali. Um, but we wouldn't be there saying you thou can talk to this person or not. That really wouldn't be a helpful role for the UN. Back to you. That's great. And in fact, one of the questions that I have um, from our participants, and um, I'll put it to you, um, Ambassador Lasoda, because I think it also goes to the heart of your own sort of pillars. Um, one of the questions from Baba Alpha Uma, um, how may um, African um, governments, and, and because we're talking about the Sahel, I'll just reduce it to the Sahel government. How may African or how may Sahel governments be held accountable when it comes to human rights violations both by their security forces and by militias they, they, they seemingly back. I raise that also, um, Ambassador um, um, Lasada, because we know that the, one, that the EU's global strategy, one of the considerations um, in that strategy in, is the, the, the change in nature in the way in which you will support um, militaries, um, African militaries on the continent. And I guess there is a, an important concern there in terms of how you deal with the question of human rights violations and the UN's own reporting um, from MINUSMA has oftentimes documented um, human rights abuses by security forces. So how do you, how do you think you can address that within your, your, both your global strategy but your Sahel strategy? Thank you, thank you for this question, which I think is, uh, is fundamental. You know, the, the EU is fully engaged in supporting uh, the Sahelian countries, supporting the G5, uh, and then supporting, of course, one of the important elements of the G5, which is uh, the, jo the, the joint force. Uh, if this joint force commits some exactions, indirectly, uh, our people here make us responsible for that. That's, it's a question which is of utmost importance for the, for, for the, for the EU. We have, uh, we have a compliance framework uh, with, the UN, with the UN and with the G5 on human rights, and, and we have decided to put, it in plain, to put it in place. We have started actually already to put it in place. And this is very, very good because we are in a very close partnership with the UN. The UN has a great experience in the question of human, um, of the defense on, on, on human rights. And these uh, can, if we don't make the proper action, 
this can have terrific uh, consequences for us and for all, the, for all the region. I said it before, there is a need of confidence between the population, their armed forces and their authorities. The armed forces, unfortunately, sometimes uh, act because the armed forces are maybe composed. I don't like to talk too much about ethnia. I prefer always to talk uh, about different community groups, uh, agricultures, herders, which are, which, are, which are different activities. What has really happened in the region? I think it's very, it's, it's very complicated, but put, to put it in a simple way, we have traditional clashes. We come from very long time ago, which have been accelerated, been put in uh, more violent because of two reasons, the demographic explosion, which is taking place in the region, and the climatic change, which less land to till or, or less, less, resource, less resources. These two elements have made that these traditional clashes, which were arranged before by local authorities with the local and traditional authorities, the caddies and, and all these uh, kind of authorities, which have unfortunately almost disappeared. This has been taken by the jihadists in a very clear, and then they have a strategy, very clear strategy in order to increase this sort of clashes and to make the situation completely chaotic and to come themselves are the only one who can give a proper solution or a proper uh, response to, to that. And this is a very clear strategy. And for that, we are with our human rights strategy. We have with the UN who knows better than anybody how to deal also that on the ground because of their, of their, of their, of their experience. And that's the way that we have to act. And you have said before that the EU has put in the strategy, the question of human rights as a key, a key, a key element. Because I said, mm -hmm. I said it again, if we don't act with that, if we don't fight against impunity. The fight against impunity is something fundamental. And there are missions, the mission of the EU, the PA, uh, PSDC mission, ECAP, uh, Mali, Ocap Niger, are really working very hard in training judges, in training uh, and UTM, in training soldiers, in order that the respect of human rights must be something elemental. And they are all very conscious of that. Um, High Representative Borrell has directed himself to all the ministers, to all the authorities in the region. We agreed on that. And actually we can see already uh, so we can see already some progress in, the, in, this, in this aspect because they are conscious that this doesn't only affect them, it affects the whole region and the whole unsteadily situa situation. Uh, I think that our partnership with the UN in this aspect also is, fun is, is fundamental and we are going to keep on that and, with the G and of course with our signing partners and we'll keep on that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador, stay there, because I have a um, number of questions that I think are, are appropriate for, for, yes. for the EU. And I'll also encourage um, our participants on, on, on the YouTube channel um, to continue to field um, some questions. But Ambassador, there's one question I'd like you to consider, and then I'll mm -hmm. come back to you to, to answer it. Because, but it's, because it's a hefty question, I want to just put it to you now to think about it, and then I will turn to um, Ambassador um, um, Adamson as well. So the question from one of our, from actually from one of our colleagues um, in, in Brussels, I mean, their the observation is that it, it's a positive signal to hear um, about the intention of the EU leadership to give much higher priority to governance within a multi sort of multi-dimensional political approach. At the same time, the EU will continue to maintain a significant presence um, with its security and defense initiatives. And on top of that, um, the new European um, Tabkuba um, task force that will be integrated under the French Burkan um, command. So the question to you is that, what is the future of the EU security support in the Sahel? What does it look like? Um, what does the EU expect to achieve with the extension of its military training mission um, from Mali to Burkina and into Niger? And what do you see ambassador as the potential pitfalls of a larger uh, military footprint in the region. And then um, Jean, Jean of a question for you to consider, um, um, you know, how far are local ownerships um, and good governance in the G5 um, countries, how far do you think they're reflected in, in the European Union's initiatives? And, and what could a, a common approach look like um, in terms of what the EU is doing and what other actors are doing? But um, Ambassador, um, Adamson, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you, know, you know, as I said at the beginning, it's seven years since international um, action. And this year, 
we celebrate the anniversary of the of, of the peace accords you know and one of the questions that has been asked is you know how significant are the requests that are coming in today to amend the Algiers um, agreement um, what do you see and, and let me add my own questions what do you see as sort of the weak links and what do you think we need to do to make sure that the accord um, remains on, on track because much of MONUSMA's mandate um, is very much tied also to the, to the accord. So I thought I'd sort of get your quick perspective and then, and, and, and then I'll turn back to Ambassador Lasoda and John Hervé. Uh, thanks very much. So um, looking at what could be you know, the positive outcomes of the accord and back over those five years, had we uh, been able to go um, more deeply with um, security cooperation between the signatory parties, decentralization of resources and powers to the regions, um, I could imagine that that might have been um, a powerful signal to some of the terrorists who then subsequently came in and exploited chaos. And I dare say um, it might have helped with the, the creeping into the center had we been able to implement some of those key elements. But looking at where we are now, um, there's a positive sign to me is that in the transitional government, for the first time, you have ministers who come from the former rebellion parties. They're actually serving as ministers uh, with some pretty chunky portfolios, like the minister of um, of works and you know some some real ministries that, that matter to uh, ordinary citizens. So you've, you're by, you're baking in in a way to the transition and to the um, to the success of the transition, the equities of the signatory groups from the north. So that's that's a good sign. Having said that, the, the key question is still um, how much of the bargain on political reforms will the transitional authorities be able to give to the signatory parties? Because that's the bargain, sort of I'll disarm and agree sustainably to, to, to give up arms. If you will give me power sharing and decentralization and some money to run my own things with a, a degree of autonomy. And that remains still the same, um, the same fundamental bargain and where there's been a, a lack of political will, I guess, and a lack of trust um, from both sides. So um, I think in terms of your question about amending the accord, what happened in the national dialogue last year, and then it's been um, reinforced this year with after the coup is, I think a, a sense that if you did want to look at any of the text, it would all have to be done in complete agreement between the parties. It wouldn't suddenly be something imposed by Southern Mali or Northern Mali. And so there is more of a degree of confidence, I think, in the, in the people who are, who are active. But having said that, there's still a huge degree of ignorance about the peace accord. Um, probably many Malians in, in the South, or even in the North, I dare say, don't know what the peace accord's about. They don't know that it's about decentralization and um, changes and, and reforms to how people are administered, which is, which is something that probably most Malians would want wherever they are in the country. And so there is still work to be done on telling more about the accord. But I do think that, um, it, to see progress on the ground in, in the North, but both in terms of security aspects, which is DDR, but, but more about um, seeing uh, government development funds up and running, run with local equities and local citizens. You know, this is about citizen governance at, at the heart of deciding what needs to be done in my region. So there's, there's reason for hope, I think, but what we really need is to just get this momentum. The peace accord has been marked by kind of, for, few forward steps, then stagnation. And the chance now is within to align the peace accord implementation with the transition. I would like to see that we have the same 18 months um, applied to, um, to the implementation of the peace accord so that they run side by side and then it becomes a natural thing that we do, not something weird and different, but just part of the transition. Back to you. Thank you very much. Ambassador Lasada. Uh, do I need to repeat uh, yes. questions or you got it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, um, I, but I will come back after on the peace accord, if I may, also, because uh, also there is yeah. something which um, I, I've just been in Bamako and uh, attending to the CSA, and mm -hmm. I, I fully agree with uh, what John has, has said. But uh, what, for, what, first, what you what you mentioning uh, mm -hmm. about about the EU and what the EU does in the security sector? Well, mm -hmm. first we have to understand, which is not easy. I can see that uh, I, can, I can understand the, what is the architecture we have today in the, in, the, in the Sahel. And this is the coalition Sahel. 
the cell coalition, which is composed of four pillars. The first pillar is a pillar short term, is fight against terrorism immediately with Takuba, with the joint force, with Barkhane. Uh, and these are measures uh, which are, have to be taken immediately. The EU cannot participate in that due to our treaties. I mean, we cannot send fighters on the ground. We cannot make special, special involvement. Member states can, but the EU as such, because of the treaty, we have a limitation. This is short term. Then we have medium term actions, which are stabilization actions. And there, yes, and which are pillar two and three of the coalition. Pillar two is capacity building in security and defense. And then the EU is fully participating into that with our missions, training, council, uh, even financially re rebuilding, uh, rebuilding all the, uh, the, the PCs, uh, the, uh, the, the PCIT. This is pillar two. And pillar three is restoration of the state where the state wasn't present. Well, this is sometimes, uh, it's not only to bring back uh, governors, uh, in, uh, authorities, is also to bring back school, is also to bring back uh, sanitary uh, facilities which should be provided by the, by, by, the, by the state. Sometimes we said re-stabilization of the state, but the state unfortunately has never been present as such in this area. Then is at least installation sometimes, I would say myself as a personal, as a personal observation. And this is pillar two and three, which are stabilization measures are really taken by the EU as we have created, and sorry about all these acronyms that we are creating all the time, the P3S, which are, uh, which is uh, actually chaired in, in a secretariat in Brussels, and uh, we have just appointed uh, uh, two weeks ago the, the the new the new the new secretary the new head of these of the P3S, uh, and uh, and and this is really where the EU is acting, and then we have the four pillar which is after, after all, uh, the most important one where the EU has been playing is in development one. Uh, and when we say, people say, the EU is engaged in the security and forgetting the development, no. You must see the figures. The development one is, uh, the, the, the figures are 8 billion only in security. And the EU is a member state. In, in security, in development. In security, uh, the figures are much, it's much lower. We are beginning to accompany all our, all our, all our partners from the Sahel in the reform of the security sector, which is also at the heart of the problem. The reform of the security sector, which are pillar two and three, but this is not uh, where the EU has really been playing. Uh, that's where the EU has been playing very, very strongly, is playing very strongly with the development, with the development one. Then I, to sum up, to sum this, this question, the EU is, has been first a development actor and has become a security and a political actor. Mm -hmm. uh, and long, and long, and long that. But we mustn't forget that the development sector is still the most important one and the most where well, the, really the EU has been playing its, its, its role. That's Thanks. as far as this aspect. May I talk about the peace process? Or, or Please, later? yeah, for one minute, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. just for three minutes, because I've been in the one, CSA. One minute. <laughs> one minute. Sorry, I've been, I've been in the CSA in the Comité de Suivi de l'Accord. And for me, what Joanna said is very important. So far, we had two processes which were completely different. We had the peace, the peace uh, agreement process, which was going on and on, almost without any connection with the reality on the ground. That's why I always ask in the CSA, and John knows that, to have a meeting of the CSA in Kidal on the ground for people to appropriate uh, this process. And then we had the political process. We were going his own way with the political parties. For the first time, I see a window of opportunity as these two, as these two processes are now together, because we have uh, is integrated in the charter of the of the transition process. We have, as she said very properly, with ministers who are member of the armed groups. We are ministers now, and they cannot say we are not going to go along now. Then, before everybody was saying, we, the the movement was saying we don't want to go ahead because the the. the uh, the government is not taking the institutional and the political decision of decentralization. And the other part, uh, the government said we cannot go ahead because the movement are not assuring the security. Now they are one, and now really there is no excuse to go ahead. And that's what I want to say. And we really do hope and that's the main message I gave during the, the, the meeting of the CSA. I think it's very important. Sorry if I've been a bit too long. No, no, no. Thank that's, you. That's, that's great. And John Ave, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. But Ibrahim, I have one question for, for you. And, and, and I, I say this sort of projecting into the future work that you're going to do. One of the questions here um, from our participants is, 
concern about how how the how we can deal or how we can prevent um, the spread of organized violence, um, jihadi violence, for example, um, throughout the the region. And given the work that you've done, um, sort of last year on on speaking to the to the bad guys and knowing that the follow up work that you're going to do, um, it would be sort of good to get your own perspective of how you see um, the, the 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 interconnection or the transnational links between the, the various um, jihadi forces and what is the prospects um, for even beginning to probe um, what dialogue would look like as a, as a preventative measure um, to stop the spread of violence from the central Sahel to other parts of, of the Sahel countries. Um, jean um, I, I hope you remember the question that I asked, but I could repeat it if you need it. You're fine. Okay, you're mute, by the way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I, I do. I do remember that <laughs> it's some um, authorship and, and good go and good governance. I mean, yeah. yes, I mean there are there are efforts by 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 especially by the EU to foster you know local ownership and also to to foster the you know, good good governance. I think a very good example of that is uh, Central Mali and the Psirc, the plan de, de sécurisation intégrée des régions du centre. Uh, it's an attempt to actually support. Uh, a plan that was designed by, by the, the Mayan authorities. But I think that maybe more could be done and, 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 and you know, this, this question of the ownership, you know, is not going without, it, without generating some tensions. Two examples of tensions, you know, on both sides, actually. On the side of, uh, of the EU and other partners, sometimes there are frustrations with who is in charge of leading the strategy on the Mayan side. For instance, if you take the PSIAP, you know, it's, it's supposedly to be a minister, you know, the Minister of Interior, but actually you have a multiplicity of actors who are dealing, you know, uh, with the center and we are, who, are, who are implementing a piece of the Malian strategy. And I think that it creates some kind of a, of a confusion, maybe they did deliberately, by the way, it creates some form of a confusion that, that, that you know, you know, trouble, you know, the, the issue of ownership and the, and the, and the collaboration between uh, the EU and, and Malian authorities. On the other hand, there are also um, tensions on the Mayan side. You know, sometimes the Malians feel that, you know, there is a question of ownership and ownership is accepted as long as they suggest solutions that are acceptable to their partners. You know, I give you an example, for instance, is the dialogue with the jihadists. Um, you know, I think that in the last few months, several Mayan authorities have expressed their willingness to at least explore the issue of dialogue with the jihadists. But what, you know, and it's, it's in a way, it's they're expressing, you know, a political willingness to do so. And, and what I see that some actors, you know, some partners are reluctant to accept this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of strategic choice that, 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 that is made by, by, by the Mayan authorities. So to a certain extent, ownership has limitation when my authorities explore ways that are, you know, where, you know, some partners are, are, are not fully comfortable. Another example of that is actually the peace accord. And it's interesting because if you remember the Dialogue National Inclusive, the Dialogue National Inclusive actually recommended, you know, a better implementation of the peace agreement, but also a new reading, you know, relecture, you know, of the, of the peace accord. And, I agree that today, you know, there is a momentum that, that the new Malian authorities, they are eager to push for a better implementation of the, of the agreement. But also some of them, you know, also remember that, you know, according to the Dialogue National Inclusive, they should also read again the content of, of, of the agreement. It's a very sensitive issue. And I understand why, you know, you know because it, in a way it's reopening the Pandora box of the agreement. Right. And many partners are, are reluctant to engage in this direction. So mm -hmm. here again, you know, I know ownership, you know, but, but, but when it reaches some, some sensitive issues, then politics come again and there are disagreements yes. between partners. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. And Ibrahim, you've got like 30 seconds to answer a very complicated question, but it'd be good to get a quick taste from you on how you'd respond. Well, I mean, it, well, it is clear that jihadist insurgency is expanding throughout the region. It is also clear that the solutions that are put in place so far, including um, security and uh, developments have failed. It is clear that the fact that jihadist insurgencies um, are continuing is uh, um, impending the implementation of the peace agreement in Northern Mali. 
but also fueling um, intercommunal violence, um, not only in Mali, but also in Northern Burkina Faso and other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. So now, now what, we, what we do, um, I, I think we need to have a change in the strategy. And one thing that ha has been missing so far in that strategy is the idea of speaking with them. Now, I understand that the, uh, speaking with them is controversial. Um, uh, it does, if, even if it does take place, it, is, it will be difficult. Our outcomes are uncertain um, and the national guarantee success. But what we, we say is that um, it's still worth a try. Um, it can be <laughs> a few opportunities and to break the block. Um, one thing also that we need to add, um, uh, in addition to speaking um, with, with the jihadists, is that we need to engage into serious discussion about religion in this region. Um, I think this is also out of the picture. People do not take it seriously, but local population do take it seriously, and the jihadists are, are exploiting um, that fact in order to spray. And we mm -hmm. can take ownership of religion so mm -hmm. that we cut um, that grass under the feet of the jihadists. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim, thank you for that, that point. And I mean, that can unravel a whole nother host of questions that I would have liked to have asked you. But unfortunately, um, our panel has come to an end. And I really want to thank um, all four of you. I, I know the time goes really, really fast, but all four of you for giving your, your time, especially Ambassador um, Joanna um, Adamson and also Ambassador um, Lasoda. And I, I do want to end with this important line that you, um, Ambassador Ad Adamson, gave to us, which I think is an important one is that you know, we do have a working framework in the form of the transitional governments um, and plan. And you know, using that as a foundation in which to build our strategies on and in which to build um, coordination and cooperation on in the, in the future. Um, that's an, that's an in, important um, work. That's an important um, idea that you've put forward to all of us. And I think one in which I think the European Union um, is, is already sort of engaging, engaging in, and it ties in with what um, John Ave and Ibrahim have just um, emphasized around the ownership and understanding what ownership really means um, on the ground. Um, thank you so much from the International Crisis Group um, for taking part in this. Thank you also for our participants for their rich array of questions, and we hope you continue to enjoy the remaining um, sessions um, into tomorrow. Um, thank you very much and goodbye from thank me you. Um, in Nairobi. Thank you, bye -bye. thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.